Cochran here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman as we turn to part two of Democracy Now!'s national broadcast exclusive on the growing domestic surveillance state and the Department of Homeland Security's efforts to spy on dissident journalists, whistleblowers and activists. We play more of our interview with National Security Agency whistleblower William Binney. He was a key source for James Bamford's recent expose in Wired magazine about the NSA, how the National Security Agency is quietly building the largest spy center in the country in Bluffdale, Utah. Binney served in the NSA for close to 40 years, including a time as technical director of the NSA's World Geopolitical and Military Analysis Reporting Group. Since retiring from the NSA in 2001, he's warned the agency's data mining program has become so valuable it could, quote, create an Orwellian state. In 2007, the FBI raided Binney's house. An agent put a gun to his head. His appearance on Democracy Now! on Friday marked the first time Binney spoke on national television about surveillance by the National Security Agency. He revealed the agency collected vast amounts of data on communications between U.S. citizens. Juan Gonzalez and I also interviewed two people who have been frequent targets of government surveillance. Laura Poitras is the Oscar-nominated filmmaker and Jacob Applebaum, a computer security researcher who's volunteered with WikiLeaks. Poitras is the director of documentary films My Country, My Country, about Iraq and The Oath, uh, about Guantanamo in Yemen. Both Poitras and Applebaum have been repeatedly detained and interrogated by federal agents when entering the United States. Their laptops, cameras, cell phones have been seized. Presumably, their data has been copied. The Justice Department has also targeted Applebaum's online communications. I started by asking Jacob Applebaum about his work and how being targeted for surveillance has impacted him. I work for a nonprofit, and I work for the explain the, the nonprofit. The nonprofit is the Tor Project, torproject.org. It's a nonprofit dedicated to creating an anonymity network and the software that powers it as free software for freedom, so that everybody has the right to read and to speak freely. No logins, no payment, nothing. It's run by volunteers. And I also work at the University of Washington, which technically is a government institution, as a staff research scientist in the Security and Privacy Research Lab. And how has it changed my work? Um, well, uh, like Laura, I don't have important conversations in the United States anymore. I don't have conversations in bed with my partner anymore. I don't uh, trust any of my computers for anything at all. And in a, in a sense, one thing that it has done is pushed me away from the work that I've done around the world trying to help pro-democracy activists during the Arab Spring, for example, because I present a threat in some cases to those people. And I have a duty as a human being, essentially, to not not create a threat for people. And so, in a sense, the state targeting me makes me less effective in the things they even, in some cases, fund the Tor project to do, which is to help people to be anonymous online and to fight against censorship and surveillance. I'd like to ask uh, William Binney, uh, the impact of having devoted your entire working life uh, to an agency uh, that is uh, to protecting the national security of the United States, to have that very agency then turn, uh, attempt to turn you into a criminal and to view you as a, as a criminal, uh, uh, the, uh, the emotional toll on you and your family of uh, what's happened in the last few years. Well, I, I guess, f first of all, it was a very depressing thing to have happen, that they t would turn their the capabilities that I built for them to do foreign de detection of foreign threats, to have that turned on the people of the United States. That was an extremely depressing thing for me to see happen internally in NSA that was chartered for foreign intelligence, not domestic intelligence. And uh, I guess uh, that simply made it more important for me to try to do things to ex to get the government, first of all, to correct its own criminal activity. And I did that by going to the House Intelligence Committees. I also attempted to see uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, to try to address that issue to him. And I also uh, visited uh, the uh, Department of Justice uh, Inspector General's office uh, after uh, Obama came into office, by the way. <laughs> Uh, to no avail. I mean, that was before the 2009 uh, joint IG report on surveillance. Which uh, said? Uh, basically, it just said you need to you need to have better and, and more active monitoring of these surveillance programs. It didn't say anything else. So <laughs> it just simply did absolutely nothing uh, because the, the oversight that's given to the intelligence community is virtually non-existent from Congress. I mean, all that, they're totally dependent because they have no way of really knowing what's happening inside the agencies that are involved, unless they have people who would come forward and tell them, like me, 
for example. They would not know those things. Bill Benny, <clears throat> can you compare today's surveillance to John Poindexter's total information awareness, who is head of DARPA, and you can explain what that military agency was, the outcry then, forcing ultimately the Bush administration to say, it is shut down, uh, we're ending total information awareness. Well, here's how I viewed uh, Poindexter's efforts. Uh, he was actually pushed out as a, as a test, to test the waters in Congress to see how they would be receptive to something they were already doing. In other words, uh, that process of building that information about everybody, getting total information, was already happening. And they threw T Poindexter out with DARPA, which is a base at an advanced research group. They fund advanced research programs, and that was, uh, that was one of the things they, th they, they were saying they were doing, but it was actually already happening. And the question was, uh, would it be acceptable to Congress, because they were keeping it very closely held in Congress under the uh, calling it a covert program. Uh, so that makes it uh, that would make it uh, def uh, a process to find out what the reaction would be if they exposed to Congress what they were already doing. But the NSA is such a huge <clears throat> agency, and there are so many career uh, people uh, in that agency. Uh, uh, your your concerns uh, cannot be uh, yours alone. There must be many within the agency who are deeply troubled by what's oh, going yeah, on. Yeah. I'm sure there are. I mean, I know a number of them that are, but they're still they're they're so afraid to do anything. I mean, they they've seen what happened to us. They sent the FBI to us, so they're afraid of being indicted, prosecuted, and even if you win the case, if you're indicted, you still lose. Because you've had to hire a lawyer and all, like Tom did and we did. Tom Drake. Right, Tom Drake. And, and so you lose any way you, you speak of it. When they have unlimited funds to do whatever they want and you don't, they, so can, they the, can indict you on any number of things, like they tried to do with us. They didn't indict you, though. Uh, they drafted an indictment, but they didn't, they didn't actually do it because I found evidence of malicious prosecution, and they dropped it. How? Uh, <clears throat> well, the indictment was uh, drawn up against all of us who were uh, on the IG uh, report and also Tom Drake, because we all met, plus some others, at uh, the Turf Valley Club, and they had all, all our emails and all of our uh, data to show that we were doing that. Plus, they had the, the view graphs that we prepared there, uh, and their whole uh, objective there was how could we incorporate to attack Medicare and Medicaid fraud. And so what we were doing was preparing a, a, a joint teaming paper that would be a kind of a incorporation papers. Uh, they called that the conspiracy paper. They called it a conspiracy. Uh, and we were conspiring to do something. Uh, but they didn't they thought they had all the exculpatory evidence, and they didn't, because there were two other people there that weren't that had never had a clearance, and, and they were going to participate in this in this development. So they had all the data, too. And uh, when I found out, because uh, they told our, our lawyer that they were preparing to indict us on that as a conspiracy, uh, why well, I went through and uh, pulled all the data together. And since Tom had been indicted at that time, and I knew his phone was tapped uh, so I, by the FBI, I decided I would give him a call and tell him what all the evidence is of malicious prosecution uh, so that I was speaking to the FBI people and they would pass the information along to the DOJ that would say, hey, we know you're, this is malicious prosecution. You had the, the, um, uh, the emails that uh, listed the agenda of what we're going to discuss at the, at, the, at the Turf Valley Club. You also had all of the slides that we prepared at the Turf Valley Club. And, oh, by the way, if you need to find out when they were prepared, you go in to click on the file, go down to properties, look into properties, and see in the date and time that the file was created. And that's when we were at the Turf Valley Club. So it was direct evidence of what we were doing there. Plus, there were two other people that were there that, that they didn't have a grudge against, so they weren't targeting. And they never talked to them at all about what the meeting was about. So I said, this is all evidence of malicious prosecution, and you need Tom to tell your lawyer about this, because I was telling the FBI that uh, we're going to notify all our lawyers what you're doing. So, and after that phone call, we never heard about the Turf Valley Club again. That was dead. Tom Drake then, though, faced espionage they created, charges. Yeah, they they said he charges. had aided the enemy, etc. <clears throat> Ultimately, the case went away. Uh, he fabricated charges, yeah. William Benny.
Federal aviation regulators have acknowledged dozens of universities and law enforcement agencies have been given approval to use drones inside the United States. The list includes Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, various branches of military, defense contractor Raytheon <coughs> drone manufacturer, um, General Atomics, as well as numerous universities. Police departments with drone permits include North Little Rock, Arkansas, Arlington, Texas, Seattle, Washington, Gadsden, Alabama, and Ogden, Utah. Well, that's simply another step in the assembly of uh, information. This is the visual part of the uh, of the electronic d information they're collecting about people. So here's your visual part. I mean, you could collect on phone the cell phones as you move around, and and then you could watch them now with a drone. And it's not just the NSA who can gather phone no, information. Police departments now. Right. Actually, I think it's shared uh, because if you. If you go back and look at uh, Director Mueller's testimony on the 30th of March to the Senate Judiciary Committee, he responded to a question when he was asked uh, the question of uh, how would you prevent a future Fort Hood. Uh, he was he responded by saying that uh, uh, we have gotten together with the DoD and have created this technology database. He called it a technology database. Uh, Utah will be included in that, I'm sure. And Meaning Bluffdale. Uh, yeah. Right where they're building this massive it's storage, data center. Yeah. And he said, in the, from this technology base, with one query, we can get all past and all future emails. So we only have to make one query to get it. So that means he gets a target, puts a target in, goes, goes into the base, pulls all past ones, and as they come in, then he gets all future ones. So uh, that, that says they're sharing it across the uh, legal, with the legal uh, authorities. So. But then also having these private defense contractors and universities, I mean, you're talking about a, a potential in terms of uh, uh, not only of people gathering information, but of malicious use of that information. Yeah, you want to see if your wife is cheating on you? Okay, you could do that, yes. That's right. There's a, that's the hazard of assembling all this kind of data. It's not just the, the government misusing it, but it's also people working and looking at it and using it in different ways. They have no effective way of monitoring how people are using that information. They don't. You can get information under the Freedom of Information Act um, uh, about your FBI files, but can you get information about what the NSA has on you? And explain the difference between the CIA and the NSA. I think a lot of people don't even realize there's this far larger um, intelligence agency in the United States. Yeah, than the it's CIA. about three to four times less large. Yeah. Um, the difference is that the primary focus of uh, CIA is supposed to be human intelligence, uh, a human espionage, you know, like spies, like recruiting uh, uh, sources around the world and so on, uh, whereas NSA's responsibility is electronic uh, intercept and electronic uh, analysis of electronic communications to form intelligence from what they're either saying or how they're acting to, to assess threat. Um, and CIA is to take the people input side, the, the human input but side. That's their charter anyway. So, uh, but they also do some of their own uh, intelligence gathering. That the, there's kind of some overlap there, uh, which is, uh, I, I guess, a part of their charter. Also, I'm, I've not really looked at the CIA charter that that much, but so. I, but I do know they do some of that. But they're primarily focused on uh, human intelligence. And has there been any historic conflict or competition between the NSA and the CIA, as you often have seen now, more it's, recently with the FBI and the CIA? It's not, it's not historical. It's continuous. Right? It is a continuous uh, competition. Uh, it's, it's the barrier for sharing, I, 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 the way I would put it, is they're, they're hesitant to share knowledge and information because then that's sharing power and, and you no longer control that kind of input to higher authorities for decision-making. So uh, when they do that, that's like releasing knowledge and releasing their power to others. And that, that's a barrier for them. Jacob Applebaum, I asked you before how people can protect themselves. Uh, I remember you mentioned when they took your computer, the authorities uh, at the border, um, there wasn't a hard drive in it. Um, explain uh, what people can do. Well, I think one thing that is important is to know that if you're being targeted these people, they're, you know, in the weapons industry. It turns out that they also have the ability to break into computers. So if you're being targeted, you have to take a lot of precautions. Uh, for example, there's a bootable CD called Tails, and the idea is you run Linux and all your traffic routes over Tor, so you don't have something like Adobe Flash trying to update itself. 
and then the NSA or someone else gets to perform what's called the man-in-the-middle attack. Instead of using Gmail, using something like RiseUp. I mean, after their server was just seized, I think kicking them some cash is probably a good thing. They provide mutual aid for people all around the world to have emails that are not just given up automatically, or even with a court battle. They try to encrypt it so they can't give things up. So people can make choices where their privacy is respected, but also they can make technical choices, like using Tor. <laughs> to ensure, for example, that when data is collected, it's encrypted and it's worthless. And, and, and I think that's important to do, even though it's not perfect. I mean, there is no perfection in this, but perfection is the enemy of good enough. How do you download Tor, T-O-R? You go to torproject.org, HTTPS, uh, colon slash slash www.torproject.org, and the S is for secure, for some value of secure. And you download a copy of it, and it's a web browser, for example, and the program all put together, double-click it, run it, you're good to go. You can uh, even Skype on it? Uh, you, I would really recommend using something like Jitsi instead of Skype. Every time you use proprietary software. Jitsi is spelled? Uh, J-I-T-S-I. So every time you use proprietary software, you have to ask yourself, why is this provided to me for free? And now that Microsoft is involved with Skype, the question is, doesn't Microsoft have some, some sort of government leaning on them, say the U.S. government, to give them so-called lawful interception capabilities? And of course the answer is going to be yes, right? If you log into Skype on a computer you've never used before, you get all your chat history. Well, why is that? Well, that's because Skype has it. And if Skype can give it to you, they can give it to the feds, and they will. And everybody that, that has that ability will. Some will fight it, like Twitter, but in the end, if the state asserts it has the right to get your data, sometimes without you even knowing that that's happening, they're going to get it if they can get it. So we have to solve these privacy problems with mathematics, because it's pretty hard to solve math problems with a gun or threat of violence. Right? No amount of violence is going to solve a math problem. And despite the fact that the NSA has got a lot of people working on those math problems, you know, podunk cops in Seattle for example, they're not going to be able to do that, and the NSA is not going to help them. Now, they may have surveillance capability. They may have MC catchers that might have automatic license plate readers. They have an incredible surveillance state. They're still not the NSA. And even if they are sharing information, what we want to do is make whatever information they would share worthless, especially if it's encrypted. So if your browsing is going over Tor, at least if someone is watching your home internet connection, they don't see that you're looking at Democracy Now!'s website. They don't see that you're checking your Rise Up email. They see that you're talking to the Tor network. And there's a lot of value in that, especially because your geographic location is hidden. So when you log into Gmail, let's say you still use Gmail, but you don't want Gmail to have a log of every place you've been. You use Tor, and Gmail sees Tor, and anyone watching you sees Tor. And that's really useful because it means that they don't get your home address. They don't know when you're at work. You make the metadata worthless, essentially, for people that are surveilling you. I think you may have just gotten a lot of customers for, <laughs> for, Tor, for Project Tor. When your computer or phones are taken at the airport, do you use them again? I never had my phones returned to me, and I can't talk about that. Uh, and my computer, I had, I mean, I, I, I can't remember where I put it. So, I mean, the government back door that's probably in it is uh, hopefully in safety somewhere. The New York Times blog says companies that make many of the most popular smartphone apps for Apple and Android devices, Twitter, Foursquare, Instagram, among them routinely gather the information in personal address books on the phone and in some cases store it on their own computers. The practice came under scrutiny Wednesday by members of Congress who saw news reports that taking such data was an industry best practice. Hmm. Jacob Applebaum? Sounds like a data value is waiting to happen. <clears throat> what gives you hope, William Benny? You worked uh, in a top-secret agency for close to 40 years. You quit soon after 9-11 because you saw that the agency was spying on the American people, and you would help develop the program that allowed this to happen. Yeah. Well, the only thing that gives me hope is programs like this, or Wired articles that Jim Bamford would write about this activity to get the word out so that people can be aware of what's happening, so in the democracy we can stand forward and, and vote in some way as to as what we want our government to do or not to do, and what kind of information we want them to have or not to have. And are there any members in Congress that you see of, of waging a good fight out on this issue? Uh, well, Senators uh, Weidel and Udall are. So Wyden and Udall, they are. 
uh, uh, and there are others, they're just not speaking up. Of course, the problem is, you see, they can't tell you what they're well, concerned why, because— Why can't they tell you? I mean, what would well, be because the what happens when, if they did, for example, they would lose their clearance immediately and be off the committees. Talk about the Gang of Eight, what they know, yeah. who they are. Uh, well, the, according to Cheney, it originally started with the Gang of Four. And then after the uh, 2004 um, uh, objections in the DOJ, then it expanded to the Gang of Eight. The Gang of Four initially was the majority and minority leader of the Intelligence House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Hipsy and Sissy. Uh, then after the uh, uh, and that uh, on the House side that was Chairman Goss and Nancy Pelosi initially in 2001. Uh, I don't remember the other two um, on the Senate side. Um, and then it expanded in 2004. It expanded to the Gang of Eight, which added on top of those four. It added the senior, the majority and minority leaders of the House and the majority and minority leaders of the Senate. So, Jacob Applebaum, Laura Poitras, your response to what these civilian um, elected leaders know? Well, it's shameful. I mean, I don't know how they're going to explain it to their grandkids, right? I mean, I think this whole nine, nine, post-9-11 nine era, is it's indefensible, right? I mean, and so, so if the risk is losing one's clearance, is that really a risk? I mean, are... I don't know. It seems to me that if you have that kind of information, you have an obligation to come forward with it, because it's illegal. And, and they've been saying that. I mean, they've, they, you know, Wyden and Udall have been saying that this is illegal, or that there's a secret interpretation that the, the American public doesn't know about. And I think that they should come forward, because well, they... Yeah, more importantly, it's a violation of, their con of the constitutional rights of every American citizen. And that's a violation that they took a note to defend against. I think that it's, you know, Jacob Cindy, Cindy Cohen at the EFF is fighting the good fight. Electronic Frontier Foundation. Yeah, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is like the, the legal version of Rise Up in My Mind, you know? They're really amazing, and they're fighting these cases such as NSA v. Jewel. And I think that it is incredibly important basically to point out, I mean, we're going to talk about Congress for a second. I mean, the judiciary has we have 30 some, seconds. They have some power, but what really, what really matters is that Congress needs to have people like Bill. They need to have people who actually understand the technology questioning people like General Alexander, not people who are bamboozled and fooled by the word email or the word network. And that's what we need to do, is we need to have people that know speak to the people that don't know, and that is Congress. Jacob Applebaum is a computer security researcher. He works with the TORProject.org. That's T-O-R-Project.org. William Binney directed the NSA's World Geopolitical and Military Analysis Reporting Group. That's National Security Administration. Uh, he worked there for close to 40 years. And Laura Poitras is the Oscar-nominated filmmaker. Her films, My Country, My Country, and The Oath. This was part two of our broad discussion on the surveillance state. We began it on Friday. You can go to our website at democracynow.org to see the full discussion or read the transcript or listen.